to our next speaker, and that is Emer Darcy, the head of family law reform in the court service. So Emer has worked in the court service since 2004 and held a variety of roles in a mix of operational and support areas, including managing a family law office, HR, and leading the COVID-19 response team. She's now fortunate, and I love to hear this, to be doing her dream job, as she says, leading the family reform stream of the modernization program. It's an area of passion for her, and she says that together we will make changes to support better outcomes for people, families, and children who are dealing with family law-related matters. Emer worked in a range of other departmental roles prior to taking up this current one in a variety of areas such as telecoms, aviation legislation, international security policy. She's volunteered for 20 years at the Special Olympics and recently finished a master's on leadership and innovation in the public sector. Over to you, Emer. Thank you very much, Sinead, for that uh, introduction. And uh, thank you uh, to and family for asking me to speak today. Um, and can I just wish Karen a happy 20th anniversary? Um, which would be great. So I think, Noel, you're going to um, look after the the um, screen for me. Yeah, it's up now, Emer. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, what I'm going to do today is just really give you a context of the Court Service Modernization Programme to give you an idea of the approach that we're taking, the aspects that we're going to be looking at, uh, and, and the time frame um, in relation to it. I'm just going to see if I can take control of the screen. Uh, I don't think I can actually. So maybe you might move on to the next slide for me. Thank you. So just to put the court service modernization program in a context for you, it's a long term program. The modernization program goes out to 2030. So we won't be having a few chats between now and September and then implementing an amended system by Christmas. This is a long term approach to the reform of family law. We are, there's a lot of activities already underway, but we're at the very beginning of this longer term process. So unlike the civil reform program, which has a report with hundreds of recommendations in it, um, our modernization program has a lovely line that says reform family law. So that's, that's the, the piece that we are picking up from. Um, so the approach that we will take is that there's going to be progressive and incremental changes happening over the coming weeks, months and years. So it's not going to be a case of spending lots of time talking about things and doing nothing. We will be trying to take um, a different approach to how we go about this. So if you could move on to the next slide, please, Maeve, thank you. Um, I'm including this because this is about the only photograph of me in known existence with my hair done. Um, so I just thought I'd take the opportunity to put it out there. Um, the team that we have in place, we've taken a different approach again in relation to this team. We have a multidisciplinary team in place from the very beginning of the program. We have a subject matter expert in Alan who's worked in court offices. Stephen has change program and change management expertise. Niall and Ashling are bringing their IT development uh, specific experience. And we're also getting support from our transformation partner Deloitte in terms of how we go about service design and transforming uh, uh, such a large area of work. So um, the next slide, please just, this is the vision that the team has set for themselves in terms of this program. So or what has ha been happening up to date is that a piece of legislation will be introduced and we would look at it and we would design a process and we would shoehorn it into an IT system and we do training for people and we'd say, off you go. What we're doing this time around is that we are putting people at the center of what it is we are going to do. So the people, the children, the families that the system is for will be the core of what we do. And what we want to do is to develop the system in such a way that they are best empowered and supported so that they can make their own choices about what's best for their individual circumstances. So for example, instead of a parent coming into one of our family law offices and saying, I want to make an access application and be told, fill that out three times, sign that, bring it to this, go to a solicitor, go there, and immediately drive them into the court process. We want to take a human-centered design approach, and we want to understand what the needs of the people are, what they need to best consider what they need to do at that point in time. And that's quite a shift in terms of how we are developing our processes, our procedures, our buildings, the big picture of it. One of the most important things as well is that we'll be taking an evidence-based approach as we go through this. So, you know, if something is working, great. 
let's continue it. If it's not working, either change it or ditch it and move on and try and find another option because we can't just put something in place and say, oh, well, that meets the criteria, let's move on. It has to work for people. And the fundamental outcome for all of this is that children, parents, family get the best possible outcomes for themselves in their circumstances. Uh, could move on to the next slide, please? Thank you so much. So this is just to give you a flavor of how we're engaging with people in relation to the family law reform stream of the modernization program. So we started initially with consulting with staff because they are on the front line and they see, they see the stress, they see the difficulty, they know what's working, they know what's not working. Um, and they have identified quite a number of issues to us in a recent staff survey. 61% uh, of them said that our buildings don't support people. 90% felt that our technology is not being used in an appropriate way to best support people. Um, and they're also very conscious of the fact that we're not best supporting the broader needs that people have. So in addition to consulting staff, we're also starting to speak with a larger stakeholder group, including the judiciary, legal practitioners, but also to step outside the legal bubble and take that much more inclusive approach to understanding people's needs, be they cognitive, um, literacy needs, cultural issues, language issues, whatever that may be. So we're broadening that horizon of maybe the traditional stakeholders we would have spoken to. So from that, we're preparing this future state design of what we think family law services in the court service should look like. And we're using lovely terminology like agile and sprints. Um, and we've actually just gone through one at the moment um, over the last week. And as we put together a perspective view on what this should look like, we will then be linking back in with users and with people and to support that with research and to validate what we're doing so that it's not a system designed by Ema and her team, um, it's a system that supports the needs of people. And it's only when we've done that will we be able to move into a position where we identify projects, future projects, and then move into delivery. And as I said, underpinning all of that is going to be ongoing data and analysis work. We're very conscious that there's gaps in terms of our understanding of the court process, how it works, what the impacts are. We don't even know whether we're giving people the correct advice and information at a particular point in time. So there's a lot of information for us to learn there. Um, next slide, please, Maeve. So this is just to give you an idea of the types of things we will break down into those individual chunks or sprints. This is really high level stuff. There's lots of those stuff that's not covered in here. It's just to give you a flavor of what we're looking at. So over the last two weeks, we've been looking at provision of information to the public, and I'll be able to give you a little bit more feedback about what we've done about that. We expect that the next area we're going to look at is in relation to buildings and facilities, because what we currently do is we tend to look at the court application, the court uh, interaction in the courtroom, and maybe forget about the broader picture. We need to understand what it's like for people before they even come next or near a court house. What do they need? What's in place? What's not, what's not in place? And really, what's just going to make an extremely difficult situation just a little bit easier uh, by asking those questions? Another area that we're going to look at is the courtroom layout, because a lot of courtrooms are heritage courtrooms. They have that very old fashioned, I suppose, criminal structure within them. So that's a possible area of conversation we'll be having to see how can we change the courtroom or should we change the courtroom so that people are stronger participants in the case that's going on about their own lives and their own children. We'll be looking at huge areas in relation to processes, digitization, obviously, how we can use digital to make things more supportive, but also being very, very conscious of the fact that digital is not the only solution. Um, people have all kinds of, of needs and requirements that mean that we can't just force everybody into a digital situation. And that's absolutely not something that we're intending to do. Um, and throughout all of this is a very conscious decision that we're going to design for inclusion, which is something we know we have not been good at. So that we understand people's language issues, we can you know, perhaps look at how we provide interpretation. How do we provide... You know, if somebody has a sensory issue, why are we inviting them to court at a time when it's the most stressful, most crowded point? Is there an option for them to select a time of day that will allow them to be their best self when they go into court? Um, looking at cultural issues, the training that's needed for, for all those kind of issues. Um, so if you can move on again, please. 
Now, this is just to give you kind of an idea of our, our timeline at the moment. So the team was established towards the end of March. What we have done, as I said, we've conducted that court service family law survey. We have done um, some international best practice research to get some ideas from the big picture. And I've taken note, Jan, of all of your hyperlinks. Um, I think we've definitely found some of them, but we'll be looking at the rest of them. Um, we have documented the high level existing services and operations because that's something that's very inconsistent from one location to another. And that's also something we need to look at. We've also started looking at analysis on data. Um, and as I said, we're beginning the engagement judiciary with staff and stakeholders. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing on an area of the provision of information to the public in terms of what that might look like in the future. Um, so we did work with staff, we have done work with some government agencies and departments, we have worked linked in with quite a number of advocacy groups to try to create a picture of what that future might look like, focused at all times on the best outcomes for people, families and children. Um, so I, I'll be able to give you a little bit more information about that and some of the ideas that have come out from, from those um, workshops. So it, because um, Hammond Lane uh, is a the fit built for purpose family law, first family law course that will be built, that process, the planning and design process is underway. There have been consultations. So in light of that, we're going to link the modernization team in with the Hammond Lane team so that we can start looking at the, the best practice service design in relation to Hammond Lane and feed as much of that as we can into, into the building design. And that's as far as we've got in terms of our planning so far, because we need to uh, regroup after, after this week and plan for the, the courtrooms. But again, the key piece here is that we will be talking to people, hearing from people, understanding experiences, checking in with you to make sure that we've understood and that what is being suggested is actually solving the problem for people, um, reducing stress and just making things a little bit easier. Um, next slide, please. So here's some of the ideas, and then there's one decision that I, I'm very proud of. Um, so what we, some of the things we're talking about, I suppose they reflect some of the things actually that Jan was uh, mentioning, that we would, through either an app or website, um, that we would have a solution explorer or a step-by-step -step guide for people who could put in information about their own personal circumstances and be provided with information and links to supports so if you are a parent, for example, who's seeking um, information on how to apply for maintenance because you are separating, that you would also be given information and links to parent supports, information on how to speak to your children about what's going on, how to support your, your children through your relationship breakdown. So it'll be a much more holistic picture of the family and their needs and requirements, rather than just telling them three of those forms, two of those forms, thanks very much, trying to link up the existing resources that are in the system to best support people. And also to guide people to say, you know, this is complicated, you might need to seek legal advice, and this is how you go about doing that. You might need financial advice. Um, so just to be able to give people pointers and ideas about what they might need to consider as they move forward in their, in their own personal journey, um, that whatever way we provide the information, and as I said, very conscious that we can't just do this digitally, we have to support this through other means. But whatever way we provide that information, it will be designed to meet the needs of um, the family court users. So as I said before, that they can make their best decisions and they can understand what this is about and that they can have better expectations um, because sometimes people come to a court office and they think that they can just get a domestic violence order there and then that the office can issue it. They don't necessarily, they're, in a, they're in, a, in, in a place of chaos and crisis and they're concerned. Um, so how we provide the information is obviously key as well. We have to understand the, 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 the headspace that people are in when they come to talk to us. You have about a minute um, left, Sure, thank you. Um, another thing is that we would create a children's hub, very much linking in with the existing resources and the experts in this area to figure out how we best support children who are either hearing about their parents separating or perhaps want to speak up in court or who are the subject of court proceedings. Um, we're looking at obviously remote and digital ways of working so that we can just make sure that people spend less time in a court building because 
you know, it's not a grand day out for anybody to spend time in that very intimidating environment. Um, and as I said previously, we're, we'll make sure that the user need is feeding into what we do and what we build, particularly in relation to Hammond Lane. And the last thing to say is just that, you know, we have um, on foot of a suggestion by Deirdre, our office manager, Nina, who introduced us to the idea of being trauma informed. The court service has recently developed and piloted trauma informed training and it had got the highest and most positive response of any pilot program that we run. So the court service has made the decision to become a trauma informed organization and it will be mandatory training for all of our staff. And we're going to be rolling that out over the next year or two. So I'm on to my very last slide and it's only a comment. Um, so I just want to say that I think this is really exciting. I think we have been given the most phenomenal opportunity to look at this from, from scratch and to take the opportunity to build a legacy together for our current and future generations. And I really look forward to, to working with all of you, collaborating with the people, hearing from you. And um, I think together we can really make some great changes. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emer, and, and your passion and enthusiasm is really infectious. It's just wonderful to hear it uh, in your, throughout your presentation. Um, I used to work in the tech sector, so those words like agile and stuff, they're just, it's really interesting to see it. And, and what I can see is obviously a very innovative approach, very user centered, which is really exciting and good to see. And that trauma informed training, it's something that at the commission we're promoting a lot in places like uh, Direct Revision, the, the, the white paper um, and the importance of trauma informed. Uh, approaches and trauma training um, uh, for, for different groups. So really wonderful to hear about that. 